Welcome to my channel, The Art of Believing, an audiobook by Neville Goddard. Chapter 1. Law of Reversibility Pray for my soul. More things are done by prayer than this world dreams of. Tennyson. Prayer is an art and requires practice. The first requirement is a controlled imagination. Parade and vain repetitions are alien to prayer. Its exercise requires tranquility and peace of mind. Use not vain repetitions, for prayer is done in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee in public. The ceremonies usually employed in prayer are mere superstitions, and have been invented to give prayer an air of solemnity. Those who practice the art of prayer are often ignorant of the laws that govern it. They attribute the results obtained to ceremonies and confuse the letter with the spirit. The essence of prayer is faith, but faith must be permeated with understanding in order to be given that active quality which it does not possess when alone. Therefore, acquire wisdom, and with all your acquisition acquire understanding. This book is an attempt to reduce the unknown to the known, pointing out the conditions under which prayers are answered and without which they cannot be answered. He defines the conditions governing the sentence in laws which are no more than a generalization of our observations. The universal law of reversibility is the foundation on which his statements are based. The mechanical motion caused by speech was known long before anyone dreamed of the possibility of a reverse transformation, i.e., the reproduction of speech by mechanical motion, the phonograph. For a long time, electricity was produced by friction, without it ever being thought that friction, in turn, could be produced by electricity. Whether or not man succeeds in reversing the transformation of a force, he knows, however, that all force transformations are reversible. If heat can produce mechanical motion, mechanical motion can produce heat. If electricity produces magnetism, magnetism can also develop electric currents. If voice can cause wave currents, then such currents can also reproduce voice and so on. Cause and effect, energy and matter, action and reaction are the same and interconvertible. This law is of the utmost importance because it allows you to foresee the inverse transformation once the direct transformation has been verified. If you knew how you would feel if you realized your objective, then, inversely, you would know what state you could realize if you awakened in yourself such a feeling. The command to pray believing that you already possess that for which you pray is based on the knowledge of the law of inverse transformation. If your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then, inversely, that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Since all transformations of force are reversible, you must always assume the feeling of your realized desire. You must awaken in yourself the feeling that you are and have that which until then you desired to be and possess. This is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours if your goal were an accomplished fact, so that you live and move and have your being in the feeling that your desire has been realized. The feeling of the desire fulfilled, if assumed and maintained, must objectify the state that would have created it. This law explains why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen and why he calls things not seen as if they were seen, and things not seen become seen. Assume the feeling of your desire fulfilled, and continue to feel it fulfilled until that which you feel is objectified. If a physical fact can produce a psychological state, a psychological state can produce a physical fact. If effect, A, can be produced by cause, B, then conversely, effect, B, can be produced by cause, A. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye ask when ye pray, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11, 24 Chapter 2. Dual Nature of Consciousness A clear concept of the dual nature of man's consciousness must be the basis of all true prayer. Consciousness includes both a subconscious and a conscious part. The infinitely larger part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. The subconscious is the most important part of consciousness. It is the cause of voluntary action. The subconscious is what man is. The conscious is what man knows. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I. The conscious and the subconscious are one, 
but the subconscious is greater than the conscious. I by myself can do nothing. The Father within me, he does the work. I, the objective consciousness, by myself can do nothing. The Father, the subconscious, he does the work. The subconscious is that in which everything is known, in which everything is possible, to which everything goes, from which everything comes, which belongs to everyone, to which everyone has access. That of which we are conscious is built from that of which we are not conscious. Not only do our subconscious assumptions influence our behavior, but they also shape the pattern of our objective existence. They alone have the power to say, let us make man objective manifestations in our image and likeness. All creation is dormant in the depths of man and is awakened to objective existence by his subconscious assumptions. Within that blindness which we call sleep, there is a consciousness in sleepless wakefulness, and while the body sleeps, this sleepless being releases from the treasury of eternity man's subconscious assumptions. Prayer is the key that unlocks the infinite storehouse. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Prayer completely modifies or changes our subconscious assumptions, and a change of assumption is a change of expression. The conscious mind reasons inductively from observation, experience and education. Therefore it finds it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reason deny. The subconscious reasons deductively and is never concerned with the truth or falsity of the premise, but proceeds on the assumption of the correctness of the premise and objectifies results that are consistent with the premise. This distinction must be clearly perceived by all who would master the art of prayer. No true understanding of the science of prayer can be obtained until the laws governing the dual nature of consciousness are understood and the importance of the subconscious is realized. Prayer, the art of believing what the senses deny, deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Through prayer, the subconscious is suggested to accept the wish fulfilled and, reasoning deductively, logically unfolds it to its rightful end. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The subjective mind is the diffuse consciousness that animates the world. It is the life-giving spirit. In all substance, there is but one soul, the subjective mind. Through all creation runs this one unbroken subjective mind. Thought and feeling fused into beliefs impress modifications upon it, charge it with a mission, which it faithfully executes. The conscious mind originates premises. The subjective mind unfolds them to their logical ends. If the subjective mind were not so limited in its power of initiative to reason, objective man could not be held responsible for his actions in the world. Man transmits ideas to the subconscious through his feelings. The subconscious transmits ideas from mind to mind through telepathy. His unspoken convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or consent, and if subconsciously accepted by them, will influence their behavior. The only ideas they unconsciously reject are the ideas you have of them that they could not possibly wish to be true for anyone. Whatever they may wish for others may be believed by them, and by the law of belief, which governs subjective reasoning. They are bound to accept subjectively and therefore express objectively accordingly. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. Ideas are best suggested when the objective mind is partially subjective, that is, when the objective senses are diminished or in abeyance. This partially subjective state can best be described as a controlled reverie in which the mind is passive but able to function with absorption. It is a concentration of attention. There should be no conflict in your mind as you pray. Move from what is to what should be. Assume the mood of desire fulfilled, and by the universal law of reversibility, you will realize your desire. Chapter 3. Imagination and Faith Prayers are not successfully realized unless there is a rapport between the conscious and subconscious mind of the operator. This is done through imagination and faith. By the power of imagination, all men, certainly imaginative men, are always casting incantations, and all men, especially unimaginative men, are continually passing under its power. Can we ever be sure that it was not our mother, while darning our socks, who initiated that subtle change in our minds? If I can unintentionally bewitch people, 
There is no reason to doubt that I am capable of intentionally bewitching someone with a much stronger spell. Everything that can be seen, touched, explained, discussed, is for the imaginative man nothing but a means, because he functions, by virtue of his controlled imagination, deep within himself, where each idea exists in itself and not in relation to something else. In him, there is no need for the restrictions of reason. The only restraint he can obey is the mysterious instinct which teaches him to eliminate all moods other than the mood of fulfilled desire. Imagination and faith are the only faculties of mind necessary to create objective conditions. The faith required for the successful operation of the law of consciousness is a purely subjective faith and is attainable upon the cessation of active opposition on the part of the objective mind of the operator. It depends upon his ability to sense and accept as true what his objective senses deny. Neither the passivity of the subject nor his conscious agreement with your suggestion is necessary, for without his consent or knowledge, he can be given a subjective command which he must express objectively. It is a fundamental law of consciousness that by telepathy we can have immediate communion with another. To establish communication, mentally call out to the subject, focus your attention on him and mentally call out his name as you would to attract the attention of any person. Imagine that he responds and mentally listen to his voice. Represent him to yourself inwardly in the state you wish him to obtain, then imagine him saying to you in the tone of ordinary conversation what you want to hear. Answer him mentally. Speak to him of your joy in witnessing his good fortune. Having heard mentally with all the sharpness of reality what you wanted to hear and having been moved by the news heard, return to objective consciousness. Your subjective conversation should awaken what you affirmed. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. It is not a strong will that sends the subjective word on its mission, so much as it is the clear thought and feeling of the truth of the state asserted. When belief and will are in conflict, belief invariably wins. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It is not what you want that you attract, you attract what you believe to be true. Therefore, get into the spirit of these mental conversations and give them the same degree of reality that you would give to a telephone conversation. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them and you shall have them. Acceptance of the end wants the means, and the wisest reflection could not conceive of more effectual means than those which are willed by the acceptance of the end. Speak mentally to your friends as if your wishes for them were already realized. Imagination is the principle of the growth of all forms, and faith is the substance from which they are formed. By imagination, that which exists in latency or lies dormant in the depths of consciousness is awakened and given form. The cures attributed to the influence of certain medicines, relics and places are effects of imagination and faith. The healing power is not in the spirit that is in them, but in the spirit in which they are accepted. The letter kills, but the spirit vivifies. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion, so whether the object of your faith is true or false, you will get the same results. There is nothing unwholesome in the theory of medicine or in the claims of the priesthood for its relics and holy places. The subjective mind of the patient accepts the suggestion of health conditioned upon such states, and as soon as these conditions are met, proceeds to realize health. According to your faith be it unto you, for all things are possible to him that believeth. The confident expectation of a state is the most potent means of attaining it. The confident expectation of a cure does what no medical treatment can accomplish. Failure is always due to antagonistic auto-suggestion on the part of the patient, arising from objective doubt of the power of the medicine or relic, or doubt of the truth of the theory. Many of us, either from lack of emotion or from excess of intellect, both obstacles in the way of prayer, cannot believe what our senses deny. Forcing ourselves to believe will end in greater doubts, to avoid such counter-suggestions, the patient must be objectively unaware of the suggestions made to him. The most effective method of curing or influencing the behavior of others 
consists in what is known as the silent or absent treatment. When the subject is not aware, objectively, of the suggestion made to him, there is no possibility of his establishing an antagonistic belief. It is not necessary for the patient to know objectively that something is being done for him. From what is known of the subjective and objective processes of reasoning, it is better that he should not know objectively what is being done for him. The more completely the objective mind is kept in ignorance of the suggestion, the better will the subjective mind perform its functions. The subject subconsciously accepts the suggestion and thinks that he originates it, proving the truth of Spinoza's dictum, that we are ignorant of the causes that determine our actions. The subconscious mind is the universal conductor which the operator modifies by his thoughts and feelings. Visible states are either the vibratory effects of the subconscious vibrations within you, or they are vibratory causes of the corresponding vibrations within you. A disciplined man never allows them to be causes unless they awaken in him desirable states of consciousness. With the knowledge of the law of reversibility, the disciplined man transforms his world by imagining and feeling only what is beautiful and reputable. The beautiful idea he awakens within himself will not fail to awaken his affinity in others. He knows that the savior of the world is not a man, but the manifestation that would save. The savior of the sick is health, the savior of the hungry is food, the savior of the thirsty is water. He walks in the company of the savior, assuming the feeling of his desire fulfilled. By the law of reversibility, that all transformations of force are reversible, the awakened energy or feeling is transformed into the imagined state. Never wait four months for the harvest. If four months from now the harvest will awaken in him a state of joy, then, conversely, the joy of the harvest now will awaken the harvest now. Now is the acceptable time to give beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for the spirit of sorrow, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Chapter 4. Energy and Power Everyone is susceptible to the same psychological laws that govern the ordinary hypnotic subject. It is susceptible to control by suggestion. In hypnosis, the objective senses are partially or totally suspended. However profoundly the objective senses may be blocked in hypnosis, the subjective faculties are alert and the subject recognizes all that is going on around him. The activity and power of the subjective mind are proportionate to the sleep of the objective mind. Suggestions that seem impotent when presented directly to the objective consciousness are highly effective when the subject is in the hypnotic state. The hypnotic state is simply being unconscious, objectively. In hypnotism the conscious mind is put to sleep and the subconscious powers are exposed as to be directly reached by suggestion. It is easy to see from this, provided you accept the truth of mental suggestions that anyone who is not objectively conscious of you is in a deep hypnotic state relative to you. Therefore, curse not the king, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich man in the bedchamber, for the bird of the air shall carry the voice, and she that hath wings shall tell the matter. Ecclesiastes 10.20 What you sincerely believe to be true of another, you will awaken in him. It is not necessary for anyone to be in a trance, in the ordinary way, to be helped. If the subject is unaware of the suggestion, and if the suggestion is given with conviction and accepted with confidence by the operator as true, then you have the ideal scenario for a successful prayer. Mentally represent to the subject as having already done what you want him to do. Mentally talk to him and congratulate him for having done what you want him to do. Mentally visualize him in the state you want him to obtain. Within the circle of his action, Every word spoken subjectively awakens objectively what you affirm. Disbelief on the part of the subject is no obstacle when you control his reverie. Bold affirmation on your part, while in a partially subjective state, awakens what you affirm. Self-confidence and full belief in the truth of your mental affirmation is all that is needed to produce results. Visualize the subject and imagine that you hear their voice. This establishes contact with your subjective mind. Imagine him telling you what you want to hear. If you want to send him words of health and wealth, imagine him saying, I have never felt better and never had more. 
and mentally tell him of your joy in witnessing his good fortune. Imagine seeing and hearing his joy. A mental conversation with the subjective image of another should be in a way that expresses not the slightest doubt as to the truth of what you hear and say. If you have the slightest idea that you do not believe what you have imagined, you have heard and seen, the subject will not acquiesce, for your subjective mind will only convey your fixed ideas. Only fixed ideas can awaken their vibratory correlates in those to whom they are directed. In controlled reverie, ideas must be suggested with great care. If you do not control your imagination in reverie, your imagination will control you. Whatever you confidently suggest is law to the subjective mind. It is bound to objectify what you mentally affirm. The subject not only executes the affirmed state, but does so as if the decision had arisen of its own accord, or the idea had originated with it. The control of the subconscious is mastery over everything. Every state obeys the control of a mind. Control of the subconscious is achieved by control of your beliefs, which in turn is the all-powerful factor in the visible states. Imagination and faith are the secrets of creation. Chapter 5 Law of Thought Transmission He sent forth his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. He transmitted the consciousness of health and awakened its vibratory correlate in the one to whom it was directed. He mentally represented to himself the subject in a state of health and imagined that he heard the subject confirm it. For no word of God shall be without power. Therefore hold fast the pattern of wholesome words which you have heard. To pray successfully you must have clearly defined objectives. You must know what you want before you ask for it. You must know what you want before you can feel you have it. And prayer is the feeling of desire fulfilled. It matters not what it is you seek in prayer, nor where it is, nor to whom it concerns. You have nothing to do but to convince yourself of the truth of that which you wish to see manifested. When you come out of prayer, you no longer seek, because if you have prayed correctly, you have unconsciously assumed the reality of the state sought, and by the law of reversibility, your subconscious must objectify what it affirms. You must have a conductor to transmit a force. You may employ a wire, a stream of water, a current of air, a ray of light, or any intermediary. The principle of the photophone or the transmission of voice by light will help you to understand the transmission of thought or the sending of a word to heal another. There is a great analogy between the spoken voice and the mental voice. To think is to speak softly. To speak is to think aloud. The principle of the photophone is as follows. A ray of light is reflected by a mirror and projected to a receiver at a distant point. Behind the mirror is a mouthpiece. Speaking through the mouthpiece causes the mirror to vibrate. A vibrating mirror modifies the light reflected from it. The modified light has its speech to carry not as speech, but as represented in its mechanical correlate. It reaches the distant station and impinges on a disc inside the receiver. It causes the disc to vibrate in accordance with the modification it undergoes and reproduces your voice. I am the light of the world. I am the knowledge that I exist is a light by which what passes through my mind is made visible. Memory, or my ability to see mentally what is objectively present, proves that my mind is a mirror, a mirror so sensitive that it can reflect a thought. The reperception of an image in memory differs in no way, as a visual act, from the perception of my image in a mirror. In both cases the same principle of vision is involved. Your consciousness is the light reflected in the mirror of your mind and projected in space toward the one you are thinking of. By mentally speaking to the subjective image in your mind, you cause the mirror of your mind to vibrate. Your vibrating mind modifies the light of consciousness reflected in it. The modified light of consciousness reaches the one to whom it is directed and impinges on the mirror of your mind. It causes your mind to vibrate in accordance with the modification it experiences. Thus, it reproduces in him what was mentally affirmed by you. Your beliefs your fixed mental attitudes. Constantly modify your consciousness as they are reflected in the mirror of your mind. Your consciousness, modified by your beliefs, is objectified in the conditions of your world. To change your world, you must first change your conception of it. To change a man, you must change your conception of him. 
you must first believe that he is the man you want him to be and speak to him mentally as if he were. All men are sensitive enough to reproduce your beliefs about them. Therefore, if your word does not visibly reproduce itself in him, to whom it is sent, the cause is to be sought in you, not in the subject. As soon as you believe in the truth of the affirmed state, the results follow. The whole world can be transformed, every thought can be transmitted, every thought can be visibly embodied. Subjective words, subconscious assumptions, awaken what they affirm. They are living and active and will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I will and prosper in that to which I sent them. They are endowed with the intelligence corresponding to their mission and will persist until the object of their existence is realized. They persist until they awaken. The vibratory correlates of themselves within the one toward whom they are directed, but the moment the object of their creation is fulfilled, they cease to be. The word spoken subjectively in quiet confidence will always awaken a corresponding state in the one in whom it was spoken. But the moment its task is accomplished, it ceases to be, allowing the one in whom the state is realized to remain in the consciousness of the affirmed state or to return to its former state. Whatever state holds your attention holds your life. Therefore, to become attentive to a former state is to return to that state. Remember not the things of the past, nor consider the things of old. Nothing can be added to man, for all creation is already perfected in him. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Man can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Heaven is your subconscious. Even a sunburn is not given from without. The rays from outside only awaken the corresponding rays from within. If the fiery rays were not contained within man, all the concentrated rays of the universe could not burn him. If the tones of health were not contained in the consciousness of the one to whom they are affirmed, they could not vibrate by the word that is sent forth. In reality, one does not give to another, but resurrects that which is dormant in him. The maiden is not dead but sleeps. Death is but sleeping and forgetting. Age and decay are the sleep-not-death of youth and health. The recognition of a state makes it vibrate or awaken. Distance, as known to your objective senses, does not exist for the subjective mind. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, thither shall thy hand lead me. Time and space are conditions of thought. The imagination can transcend them and move in psychological time and space. Even if you are physically separated from a place by thousands of miles, you can mentally live in the distant place as if it were here. Your imagination can easily transform winter into summer, New York into Florida, and so on. Whether the object of your desire is near or far away, the results will be the same. Subjectively, the object of your desire is never far away. Its intense closeness removes it from the observation of the senses. It dwells in consciousness, and consciousness is closer than breath and closer than hands and feet. Consciousness is the only reality. All phenomena are made up of the same substance vibrating at different speeds. From consciousness I came out as a man, and to consciousness I return as a man. In consciousness, all states exist subjectively and are awakened to their objective existence by belief. The only thing that prevents us from making a successful subjective impression on someone at a great distance or from transforming the there into here, is our habit of regarding space as an obstacle. A friend a thousand miles away is rooted in your consciousness through the fixed ideas you have of him. Thinking of him and representing him inwardly to yourself in the state you wish him to be, trusting that this subjective image is as true as if he were already objectified, awakens in him a corresponding state which he must objectify. The results will be as evident as the cause was hidden. The subject will express the state awakened in him and will remain unconscious of the true cause of his action. Your illusion of free will is nothing but ignorance of the causes that make you act. The success of the prayers depends upon your mental attitude and not upon the attitude of the subject. The subject has no power to resist your controlled subjective ideas about him unless the state asserted by you to be true of him is a state which he is incapable of desiring as true of another. In that case, it returns to you, the sender, and will be realized in you. 
Provided the idea is acceptable, success depends entirely upon the operator and not upon the subject who, like compass needles on their pivots, are quite indifferent as to the direction you choose to give them. If your fixed idea is not subjectively accepted by the one toward whom it is directed, it bounces back to you from whom it comes. Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? I have been young and now am old, but I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. No evil befalls the righteous. Nothing befalls us that is not of the nature of ourselves. A person who directs a malicious thought to another will be harmed by its rebound if he does not gain the subconscious acceptance of the other. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Moreover, what you may desire and believe of another may be desired and believed of you and you have no power to reject it if the one who desires it for you accepts it as true of you. The only power to reject a subjective word is to be unable to desire a similar state from another. Giving presupposes the ability to receive. The possibility of impressing an idea on another mind presupposes the capacity of that mind to receive that impression. Fools exploit the world, the wise transfigure it, the highest wisdom is to know that in the living universe there is no destiny other than that created by the imagination of man. There is no influence outside the mind of man. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Never accept as true of others what you would not wish to be true of yourself. To awaken a state in another it must first be awakened in you. The state you would like to transmit to another can only be transmitted if it is believed by you. Therefore, to give is to receive. You cannot give what you do not have, and you only have what you believe. Therefore, believing that a state is true for another not only awakens that state in the other, but makes it alive in you. You are what you believe. Give, and ye shall receive, full measure, pressed down and running over. Giving is simply believing, because what you truly believe about others, you will awaken in them. The vibrational state transmitted by your belief persists until it awakens its corresponding vibration in the one it is believed about. But before it can be transmitted, it must first be awakened in the transmitter. Whatever is awake in your consciousness, you are awake. It makes no difference whether the belief belongs to oneself or to another, for the believer is defined by the sum total of his subconscious beliefs or assumptions. As a man thinks in his heart, in the deep subconscious of himself, so is he. Disregard appearances and subjectively affirm as true that which you wish to be true. This awakens in you the tone of the affirmed state, which in turn is realized in you, and in the one of whom it is affirmed. Give, and you shall receive. Beliefs invariably awaken what they affirm. The world is a mirror in which everyone sees himself reflected. The objective world reflects the beliefs of the subjective mind. Some people self-impress best with visual images, some with mental sounds, and some with mental actions. The form of mental activity that allows all the power of your attention to be concentrated in a chosen direction is the one you must cultivate until you can bring everything into play in your objective at the same time. If you have difficulty understanding the terms visual images, mental sounds, and mental actions, here is an illustration that will clarify their meaning. Person A imagines that he sees a piece of music without knowing anything about musical notation. The impression in his mind is a purely visual image. Person B imagines that he sees the same piece, but he knows how to read music and can imagine how it would sound when played on the piano. That imagination is mental sound. Person C also reads music and is a pianist. As he reads, he imagines himself playing the piece. Imaginary action is mental action. Visual images, mental sounds, and mental actions are creations of your imagination, and although they appear to come from outside, they actually come from inside yourself. They move as if moved by someone else, but in reality, they are launched by your own spirit from the magical storehouse of imagination. They are projected into space by the same vibratory law that governs the sending of a voice or an image. Speech and images are projected not as speech or images, 
but as vibratory correlates. The subjective mind vibrates according to the modifications it undergoes by the thought and feelings of the operator. The visible state created is the effect of subjective vibrations. A feeling is always accompanied by a corresponding vibration, that is, by a change of expression or sensation in the operator. There is no thought or feeling without expression. However devoid of emotion one may appear to be, if one reflects with any degree of intensity, there is always an execution of slight muscular movements. The eye, though closed, follows the movements of imaginary objects, and the pupil dilates or contracts according to the brightness or remoteness of those objects. The breath quickens or slows according to the course of your thoughts. The muscles contract correspondingly to your mental movements. This change of vibration persists until it awakens a corresponding vibration in the subject, a vibration which is then expressed in a physical fact, and the word became flesh. Energy, as you see in the case of radio, is transmitted and received in a field, a place where changes occur in space. The field and the energy are one and inseparable. The field or subject becomes the embodiment of the word or energy received. The thinker and the thought, the operator and the subject, the energy and the field are one. If you were still enough to hear the sound of your beliefs, you would know what is meant by the music of the spheres. The mental sound you hear in prayer as if it were coming from outside is actually produced by yourself. Self-observation will reveal this fact. Just as the music of the spheres is defined as the harmony heard only by the gods and supposed to be produced by the movements of the celestial spheres, so also the harmony you hear subjectively for others heard only by you is produced by the movements of your thoughts and feelings in the true realm or heaven within you. Chapter 6. Good News How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. A very effective way to bring good news to another is to call before your mind's eye the subjective image of the person you wish to help and have him affirm what you wish him to do. Listen to him mentally, tell you that he has done it. This awakens in him the vibrational correlate of the affirmed state, the vibration of which persists until his mission has been accomplished. It does not matter what you wish to be done, nor whom you choose to do it. As soon as you subjectively affirm that it is done, the results come. You can only fail if you do not accept the truth of the affirmation, or if the subject does not desire for himself, or for another, the affirmed state. In the latter case, the state would be realized in you, the operator. The seemingly harmless habit of talking to oneself is the most fruitful form of prayer. A mental discussion with the subjective image of another is the surest way to pray for an argument. You are asking to be offended by the other when you meet objectively. He is compelled to act in a manner unpleasant to you unless before the encounter you contravene or modify his order by subjectively asserting a change. Unfortunately, man forgets his subjective arguments his daily mental conversations with others, and thus finds himself at a loss for an explanation of the conflicts and misfortunes of his life. Just as mental arguments produce conflicts, so happy mental conversations produce corresponding visible states of good news. Man creates himself out of his own imagination. If the desired state is for yourself, and you find it difficult to accept as true what your senses deny, call before your mind's eye the subjective image of a friend, and have him mentally affirm that you are already that which you wish to be. This establishes in him, without his conscious consent or knowledge, the subconscious assumption that you are that which he mentally affirmed, an assumption which, being unconsciously assumed, will persist until he accomplishes his mission. His mission is to awaken in you his vibratory correlate, whose vibration upon awakening in you is realized as an objective fact. Another very effective way to pray for yourself is to use the formula of Job, who found that his own captivity disappeared as he prayed for his friends. Fix your attention on a friend and have your friend's imaginary voice tell you that he is or has, that which is comparable to what you desire to be or have. As you hear and see him mentally, feel the excitement of his good fortune and sincerely wish him well. This awakens in him 
the vibration corresponding to the affirmed state, a vibration which must then be objectified as a physical fact. You will discover the truth of the statement, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The quality of mercy is doubly blessed, it blesses the taker and the giver. The good that you subjectively accept as true of others will not only be expressed by them, but a complete part will be realized by you. Transformations are never total. Force A always transforms into something more than a force B. A blow with a hammer produces not only a mechanical shock, but also heat, electricity, a sound, a magnetic change, etc. The vibratory correlate in the subject is not the total transformation of the communicated feeling. The gift transmitted to another is like the divine measure, pressed down, shaken and overflowing, so that after feeding five thousand with the five loaves and two fishes, twelve baskets full are left over. Chapter 7. The Greatest Prayer Imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, and then you believe it to be true. Every dream can be realized by those self-disciplined enough to believe it. People are what you decide them to be. A man is according to the way you look at him. You must look at him with different eyes for him to change objectively. Two men looked out from the prison bars. One saw the mud, and the other saw the stars. Centuries ago, Isaiah asked the question, Who is blind but my servant, or deaf like my messenger whom I sent? Who is blind like him that is perfect? as blind as the servant of the Lord. The perfect man does not judge according to appearances, but judges righteously. He sees others as he wishes them to be. He hears only what he wants to hear. He sees only the good in others. In him there is no condemnation, because he transforms the world by his seeing and hearing. The king who sits on the throne scatters evil with his eye. Sympathy for living beings, agreement with human limitations, is not in the king's consciousness because he has learned to separate his false concepts from his true self. For him, poverty is but the dream of wealth. He sees not caterpillars but butterflies painted by being, not winter but summer sleeping, not man in need but Jesus sleeping. Jesus of Nazareth, who scattered evil with his eye, is asleep in every man's imagination and from his own imagination must man awaken him by subjectively affirming I am Jesus. Then and only then will he see Jesus, for man can only see what is awake in himself. The holy womb is man's imagination. The holy child is that conception of himself which conforms to Isaiah's definition of perfection. Heed the words of St. Augustine, Too late have I loved thee, for behold, thou wast within, and it was without that I sought thee. It is to your own consciousness that you must turn as to the only reality. There, and there alone, you awaken that which is asleep. Though a thousand times Christ be born in Bethlehem, yet if he is not born in you, your soul remains forsaken. Creation is finished. You call your creation feeling the reality of the state you would call. A state of mind attracts its affinities, but it does not create what it attracts. As sleep is called by the feeling, I am sleepy, so Jesus Christ is called by the feeling, I am Jesus Christ. Man sees only himself. Nothing happens to man that is not the nature of himself. People emerge from the mass betraying their close affinity with your moods as they are engendered. You meet them seemingly by accident, but you discover that they are intimate with your moods. Since your moods are continually externalized, you could prophesy from them that, without looking for them, you would soon meet certain characters and encounter certain conditions. Therefore, call the perfect self living in feeling, I am Christ, for Christ is the only self-concept through which the unveiled realities of eternity can be seen. Our behavior is influenced by our subconscious assumption regarding our own social and intellectual rank and that of the one we are addressing. Let us seek and evoke the highest rank, and the noblest of all is that which strips man of his morality, and invests him with unrestrained immortal glory. Let us assume the sentiment, I am Christ, and all our conduct will subtly and unconsciously change in accordance with the assumption. Our subconscious assumptions are continually externalized so that others may consciously see us as we subconsciously see ourselves and tell us by their actions what we have subconsciously assumed ourselves to be. 
Therefore, let us assume the sentiment, I am Christ, until our conscious affirmation becomes our subconscious assumption that we all, with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed from glory to glory in the same image. May God awake and his enemies be destroyed. There is no greater prayer for man. As you bid adieu to this audiobook journey, may the wisdom of Neville Goddard continue to resonate within you. Remember, belief is the cornerstone of creation, and as you cultivate a steadfast faith in your dreams, the universe conspires to make them a reality. Farewell, dear listener, and may your path be illuminated by the light of your own beliefs.